Tantra Illuminated with Dr. Christopher Wallace is a journey through the depths of the human experience. As viewed through the lens of the tradition called Non-Dual Shaiva Tantra. This multi-format podcast delves into the fascinating world of classical Tantra and its intersections with philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, human development, and the broader world of spirituality. This episode is an interview recorded a few months back for the Keen on Yoga podcast. The host of that podcast, Adam Keen, interviews me at some length about my new book, Near Enemies of the Truth. Adam has been practicing yoga asana since 1999 and teaching since 2004. He ran a busy Mysore program in the city of London for over 10 years and has taught extensively internationally. He is a master of Patabi Joyce's Ashtanga Yoga, trained by Sharath Joyce and Mark Darby. Adam's teaching style is framed in inclusivity, compassion, and lucid, explicit practical instruction. Alongside this, he shares his interest in deeper inquiry about the fundamental questions of life, what we're doing and why we're here. I enjoyed being interviewed by Adam, and in fact, did two interviews for his Keen on Yoga podcast, the other of which we will share here in due course. But this one is timely because it is a somewhat thorough overview of the Near Enemies of the Truth teaching encapsulated in my new book. And so if you haven't yet read that book, this episode gives you a good sense of whether you might want to read it. So I bring you Adam Keen interviewing me on Near Enemies of the Truth. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Keen on Yoga. So this is our second podcast episode with Christopher Wallace, otherwise known as Harish, uh, his spiritual name, and uh, enjoyed the first one so much that he mentioned he had this book out and he sent me the copy very kindly pre, uh, pre to its publication, to its release, and I've read it. And so today we're going to talk about his new book, Near Enemies of the Truth, and anything else that kind of comes up so we won't be too scripted. Um, I just want to say I totally recommend it, and I mean that. It's a really, really good book. Um, near enemies of the truth is about spiritual cliches and how they're very similar or you know there's something in them but they're also very deceptive as well and can stand for going down a bit of a cul-de-sac but like anything there's a bit of truth in everything so um yeah without further delay let me say thank you again christopher for coming on harish and uh looking forward to this thank you yeah so uh yeah the, i mean the book is uh it's a, fan, it's a it's a much needed book that needed to be to be written, um, you know, because we're hearing these cliches all the time. I mean, you know, I'm just going through the book and I've read it a couple of times over, really, because I thought it's excellent because they're annoying. The spiritual cliche is quite annoying to hear for many people, I'm sure, <laughs> from the sounds of the book. Also, to Christopher's perspective, can be annoying. People are saying things like, you know, be your best self, speak your truth, uh, be in the moment. Uh, listen to your heart. Oh, there's so many of them, right? You can think of many off the cuff, I'm sure, if you're listening along. Um, and there's something to them. But on the other hand, they're very deceptive and they stand for a lack of real critical thinking or just thinking things through and connecting more deeply. So, yeah, we're going to go through a few of those today and just see where we go. Um, but first of all, because for how, you know, I mean, I know you've given the book to uh, a number of people. Um, how, how has it been received so far? Because, I mean, just to quote the introduction, you say, um, the only way everyone's point of view can be equally valid is when there's no such thing as truth. And thus relativism always masks implicit nihilism, yeah? the view that there's no fundamental truths. And so nihilism tends to make human beings very cynical and deeply dissatisfied. 
So, I mean, this is already discordant from from what many people will uh, will think wow. today that you know that the yeah, I mean, anyone's truth is their truth, right? And now you're saying, you know, from the very get go, really, that there's one objective reality here. It seems. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, what would you? How would you diffuse this situation? I think many people say, well, you know, like I believe whatever I want to about reality. Isn't our, my opinion equally as valid as Christopher's opinion? Yes, well, this is a, a thorny issue to wade into, but very much worth it. Um, I'm not actually saying there's one objective reality. Uh, I'm saying that thoughts or narratives, um, mental constructs, can never be true, but they can approach the truth more or less closely. And so we should evaluate um, the formulations of thought in terms of how close they come to the truth while admitting they can never actually capture truth because truth by its very nature is non-conceptual. It's non-verbal. Uh, and yet we must make this effort to try to get close to the truth with our words. And so it's not the case that all points of view are equally valid because some approximate truth much better than others. And we can measure this in various ways. But my, my favorite measure is efficacy, meaning to say that um, a formulation approaches the truth more closely when it can be shown to be effective that is to say, when it's sufficiently in accord with reality, that it allows us to um, make predictions that are then proved valid. It allows us to explain um, something that's happened in a way that provides utility. That is to say, that gives us actual leverage so that we can do something useful on the basis of that narrative. So, uh, you know, any formulation about reality is a narrative, but some narratives are um, more aligned with reality. And we see that in the way that they give us this leverage, allow us to do something mm. useful, like connect with each other more effectively, mm. uh, and so on. Wow. That was a tough, um, <laughs> a tough, a tough beginning I gave you, actually. But it is. I mean, I suppose it resonated with me because you know I'm often on social media, and as you know, it's a, it's a tough and thorny place, and uh, and and people, you know, often um, you know giving their own narratives, which you know, might be uh, different to my own, and and then uh, really these days, you know. It, you feel like you can't say anything to anyone. And you mentioned later in the book also this idea of gaslighting and how, uh, you know, it's so easy to say, well, your experience is then not true, therefore not really your experience either. Um, and this is coming to the speaking of the truth point in the chapter. You say, uh, if we can speak in actual argu inarguables, um, authentically undeniable truths, we rapidly get to the heart of the matter and have a productive conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. I know it's a little bit of a tangential question, but I mean, how to have a productive argument or discussion with people, especially on things like social media, when it's so easy to just throw the word around, you know, throw the, the term gaslighting around. Yet, on the other hand, as you admit yourself, we've all done it. You know, mm. we, all, we all have denied that other people are having the experience they're having. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's several levels to look at here. Um, first of all, it is indeed possible that somebody could misunderstand their own experience and therefore misrepresent it. But let's set that aside for now. Let's just give the benefit of the doubt that they're representing their own experience accurately, um, more or less. But still, what almost everyone does, especially on social media is they extrapolate from their experience to a general truth or a general proposition. Mm -hmm. And they imagine that what has been true in their experience is applicable much more across the board than it really is. And then they end up sort of weaponizing their truth, usually unintentionally, right? And they try to tell people how it is and how they're wrong on the but they don't actually take responsibility. They don't say, well, this is my experience and I have no idea if it can be extrapolated to a, a broader context. They just assume 
that it can. So that itself is already problematic. And then if we rewind to look at this um, even deeper issue, why is somebody representing their experience the way that they are? It's usually not just a factual description of their experience. It's an interpretation. And the interpretation is skewed in various ways by their past history, their assumptions, their opinions, their unresolved experiences, the, the, the shadow elements of their psyche, and so on and so on and so on. So it, it gets actually uh, quite difficult to um, ascertain where where truth lies. And I try to clarify it in that chapter by saying, well, you're on the firmest possible ground when you start from the true inarguables. And the true inarguables are, uh, on the one hand, I, I talk about objective inarguables. That's what everyone can agree on. Uh, it, it, everyone can look and see, oh, yes, that's, that's the case, right? Mm, and mm. Uh, subjective inarguables have to do with what you are viscerally feeling, not not your interpretation, but what you're actually feeling. So, you know, this this there could be countless, countless examples. Right? Yeah, I, maybe the the argument of the um, the kitchen is a good one. Maybe mention that yeah. coming into yeah, a, a dirty it's very kitchen. Very simple. It's a very simple yeah. thing that many people have experienced because yes. we have housemates or roommates, and we don't have the same behavior patterns as them. So I give the example of like, you know, you you come into the kitchen in the morning, and it's a big mess, and our usual. So, go to is to just judge the person and say, oh, what a slob or whatever. Um, but if we want to have a productive conversation, we need to base it on inarguables. So for example, when I came into the kitchen this morning and I saw the sink full of dirty dishes, right? Everyone can agree the sink is full of dirty dishes. So it's an inarguable. I felt, and then the subjective inarguable, whatever you actually felt, I felt my heart sink, or I felt deflated, or defeated, or whatever, you know, whatever is actually true for you, but expressed in terms of the bodily experience, that's the inarguable, you know, as opposed to something like that's very much arguable, like, I felt disrespected, <laughs> by yeah. by your uh, you know so th then they can immediately start arguing that but uh, the person is more likely to keep listening when instead of an accusation you've just stated these inarguables you know and of course some people are not going to be open to to listening no matter how you express yourself <laughs> but um it, it's a really about how we can heal and deepen human relationships by sticking to the, mo the most basic, the most visceral truths, instead of arguing for our interpretations of our experience, because already interpretation is 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 getting further and further away mm. from from the base truth <laughs> of the experience, mm. Mm -hmm. and then you just keep doing that because whatever response the person gives you, let's say even though you've you've spoken in this non-accusatory way, let's say they get defensive anyway then you would respond to that with your inarguable truth. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, when I hear you respond that way, I feel, I feel frustrated. Um, but it, and and they'll say, oh, have you just spent uh, an hour with some kind of psychiatrist? Let's <laughs> say back yes. to you. <laughs> yes, well, that indeed... You've been listening is, to those podcasts again, haven't you? That's, <laughs> that indeed is the problem, is that if you change your way of speaking sort of too quickly or too dramatically, people are immediately like, wait, what's, what's going on? <laughs> you know, so you might actually need to say um, what you're doing. Hey, I'm, I'm trying to uh, speak in terms of actual truth mm. as near as I can discern it instead of judgments or blame or something like that. So could you please support me in that? Because I want to, um, you know, speak in a more productive and a, and a more uh, respectful or caring way, you know, that's one thing that we can do is sort of make that meta comment <laughs> so that people understand what, what's going on. And of course, when we try to change the way we're speaking, it's we're going to stumble at first. But what's really important, actually, is not just changing the words you're using. What's really important is changing your actual perspective. 
And so that involves, which I mentioned in the book, realizing that, that everyone has the right to be as they are and to behave as they do. And so your judgment of their behavior is really uh, neither here nor there, right? Because we're all harboring these shoulds inside that we often don't even realize, these beliefs about how people should be. But actually, nobody responds well to being shoulded on. Mm. <laughs> right? And so we, we need to actually change our perspective internally. That's much better than just trying to change your words, right? Just changing the words is going to come off as artificial, uh, disingenuous, you know? Yeah, but if you yeah, can yeah. actually change your perspective and realize, oh, I may not like how someone behaves in, the, in their habits and their patterns, but they do have the right to be as they are. Uh, and I want to express my, how their actions impact me in a way that takes responsibility for my inner state instead of just engaging in the blame game, which humans have tried for thousands of years now, and it's never gone well. <laughs> so a different s sort of strategy is called for. I think you should be some kind of diplomat. It would work really well. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure you have your own arguments, but I mean, you know, I'd like to. I'd, sure. I'd like to have you on, on on my side with an argument with my wife. Um, but it's a great. <laughs> it's a great chapter. A really good chapter, actually, and a very practical one in terms of relation, general relationship guidance. It does sound though like I mean, people will say from there. Well, if there's no right or wrong, or, or people acting should or you know in, in any way that they ought to act, then you're just engaging in moral relativism. That you know anything goes then. You know, which I know is not what you're saying either. So how do you get out of that one? Yeah, that um, if we admit that well-being is better than misery, which I think we should, if we admit that as a moral truth, then we escape this moral relativism. We say, okay, well, um, some actions uh, foster well-being for myself and others more than other actions. And I want to pay attention to that because if I foster well-being, I'm going to also have better relationships. I'm going to have a lot of appreciation from others. I'm going to enjoy my connections with humans more and more if I keep focusing on what brings the maximum well-being for myself and others. But at the same time, we have to admit that any moral truth that we discern is not embedded in nature itself right we know nature is not fair we know that the that the the cute innocent big-eyed animals get eaten by the animals with bigger teeth and you know and so that's just to say that um if we think that our moral truths are embedded in nature then we mm. feel justified in imposing them on other people. And if somebody doesn't uh, want to admit that well-being is better than misery <laughs> uh, and, that, and guide their actions uh, by it, we can't say, well, you should be different from how you are. All we can do is simply step away from them, you know, is, is to not engage with uh, those people. And so those people find a new motivation for changing their behavior in noticing that nobody wants to engage with them, right? Uh, and, and for this, we have to be willing to be impolite in a way, right? Because oftentimes we are polite even to those who don't exhibit any evidence that they give a shit about anyone's well-being. And I think we need to be more honest <laughs> with those people and uh, not not pretend we're okay with their behavior mm. so there's a truth there about are you actually okay with uh, someone's behavior or not that's different from the should you see the should is a belief about how things ought to be that we that that people then weaponize yeah. mm. and, or essentially are that, yeah that it's a law of but, nature which Certainly right, not. but the, yeah. the visceral thing of mm. like, um, I, I feel profoundly uncomfortable <laughs> with the way you're acting. That is a truth that deserves to be articulated, and 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 it can be separated then from the should, right? From the should that we beat people over the head with. Here's how you should be, uh, and it's just that 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 honesty, and it's actually more vulnerable in a way 
Um, but that vulnerability is our strength, having the ability to say, wow, I feel uh, really uncomfortable about what you just said or, or how you're behaving rather than you're a jerk, you know, mm. you're not spiritual. You call yourself a yogi or whatever, mm, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Excellent. I mean, moving on from there, a slight mm. um, segue, uh, the chapter on be your best self, which um, kind of suggests that there's a better to get to, that we're trying to aspire to, you know, something more spiritual um and you mentioned uh, the self-help industry perpetuating a story the purpose of human life is psychological and spiritual growth um so if it's not spiritual growth what is it <laughs> well I, in the tradition that i come from that i that i participate in um there's a beautiful teaching that each and every being has already accomplished their purpose for being just in existing, right? Your worth is proven by your very existence, meaning to say that um, the purpose for the existence of a specific embodied being is to embody the aspect of the one or the divine that they do. And they already embody that aspect simply by existing. Uh, so, the point here is to, if, if you want to make changes, is to base that endeavor on authentic self-acceptance. That if we look at ourselves and we uh, judge ourselves, hate ourselves, find ourselves lacking, um, not good enough, I don't measure up, I'm not as I should be, mm, mm. that does not provide us with a sound basis for change. Um, because true beneficial and lasting change can only happen on the basis of reality. And the reality is that um, you're actually fine as you are, uh, because any notion that you're not is nothing but a thought. You are as you are. And the thought that you're not as you should be it can't be found anywhere in reality. It's just a thought. It's just a thought based on people's uh, pushback against this or that um, aspect of your personality or whatever. But they push back for reasons of their own. It's not. It doesn't constitute evidence uh, that you're not as you should be. Yeah. And I mean, yet, we feel this imp uh, this natural impetus to change and grow, which is beautiful if it's based on self-acceptance. Having accepted myself as I am, I feel an inspiration to grow. Mm. And that's part of nature. You know? Yeah, you and mentioned it's a kind of form of a game, you say, a form of playing, um, you know, intrinsically rewarding activity. Yeah, exactly. so, so there's a sense of lightness of touch there. I mean, because as you point out in your chapter, the irony of being your best self is to say, well, essentially, myself is inadequate. Essentially, it's a disguise, as you mentioned, worn by self-hatred. You know, essentially, yourself is invaluable or not valuable enough, and you need to be better. So, um, yeah, it's uh, definitely definitely a near enemy of <laughs> uh, one, uh, one of the closest ones, because these days it's all about progress, isn't it? And, you know, kind of being better and being you know, yeah. more... And, yeah. and that's a wonderful game to play. It's just that um, what most people are doing are deferring their self-acceptance until they become this idealized version of themselves. But that that the problem is that's a, like an ever retreating carrot. You know, you, you, you can never quite reach it. You keep putting the version of yourself that you're willing to accept in the future. And it simply stays there in the future, you know, so what I'm suggesting, and, and in fact have experienced, and many, many other people um, can testify to this, is that true self-acceptance uh, does not in any way negate the inspiration to grow and change. In fact, it provides the firmest foundation for the natural process of growth. Whereas if we are trying to change ourselves to uh, match a, a, an idealized image of ourselves generated by the mind, there's an artificiality to that and even a violence to mm. that, which ultimately doesn't serve us. And I think it also it generally is subterfuge to carry to 
carry on pushing under or suppressing a whole bunch of things you don't want to see, you know, rather than exactly. acceptance. It's like, well, actually, you know, and I agree, you know, you see things once you accept the thing and you can actually look at it and think, well, that's, I'm accepting it, but that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty noxious, you know, like to feel or to think or to behave in that way, but you can accept it and then you can be in it. And then only then, you know, you can decide, well, that's actually, you know, like not, not the way I want to continue. Whereas the, yeah. the, this, the other kind of form of it is, is, uh, yeah, it never really comes back to the kind of owning up kind of feeling of, okay, that, that is me, you know, and, and now I can move forward from there. Yeah. Uh, because any behavior that you, when you look at it in yourself honestly, and you say, wow, okay, that's not really a good uh, or beneficial trait. You, you might even ca- call it noxious, as you said. But then you need to look deeper and see, well, why? Why is that there? And you find usually there's some fear, right, that's underlying that, that's that's causing you to behave in that way. Or there's some something unresolved in your system and that what what's unresolved in your system is not your fault, but it deserves um, some attention and some care and some resolution, right? And so you see that that the basis of any so-called noxious behavior is actually something quite innocent. That there's this natural and innocent um, uh, fear or 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 something else that comes from our past uh, unresolved experiences and we all have those because as young people uh, we we can't digest our experiences we're not mature enough so we store a portion of the of the pain of the experience for later and then what happens is most people don't go back and digest that right they they just suppress it and that's what um turns adults into into unpleasant people it's simply their undigested experiences um and 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 none of those are are their fault but they are their responsibility Mm, mm. yeah and it says it speaks a lot to another chapter where you kind of mention the, the the fine line between personal responsibility and accepting that you know that we create our reality. I think that's the name of a chapter, isn't it? You create your own reality, um, mm. which then has a very heavy weight on the person. Right? It's like, well, you know, all of this is my fault. You know, when you see, you know, as you say, that uh, part of the self acceptance is just seeing the individual for what it is. So it dispels that weight of, well, I am this. I created all of this. I'm feeling this like it was a. Uh, you know, some choice that you completely thought, well, I'm going to act and feel in this or, you know, this, this way that's not efficacious, as you put it, or I would put it noxious, you know, and it always heavily, so you can't even feel it. But if you understanding the self as a more of a process as many causes and conditions coming together, as you mentioned, everything is created by everything, or, you know, then mm. it, it, it kind of disperses the weight of the whole sense of selfness that you can actually own up to a lot more, as it were, seeing yourself as as not inherently self-created, if I'm making any sense. Do you, you want to speak a little yes. bit more about that? Yeah. Yes, uh, because in fact, um, nothing is your fault because the very idea of fault is flawed. <laughs> the, the, the very idea of fault is a mental construct that doesn't uh, have any strong connection to reality. So uh, when it is in a sense true that you create your own reality, meaning to say your experience of the world and of everything moment to moment is a product of uh, factors that, that have to do with your body mind and have to do with your consciousness, right? So it, it is true that the way you're experiencing something is largely a product of the configuration of your own psyche. And so in that way, you create your own reality, but not in the sense that um, if if something bad happens, it's somehow Mm. your fault, like it's like karma or it's the law of Mm. attraction, like you thought negatively and so you attracted Mm. negativity. Mm. That's a bunch Mm. of nonsense, you know. And yet we do have this responsibility to, to realize, oh, the way I'm experiencing something is not because someone else made me experience it that way. It's because of the way that uh, my psyche, as it's currently configured, uh, responds to whatever happens in the flow of events. And so by reconfiguring the psyche, uh, we can have a very different experience. And that can either happen 
intentionally or it can happen spontaneously like with spiritual awakening where we sense oh what i am is actually not the psyche it's not the mind or body it's it's something much deeper and when you sense that the beauty and intrinsic divinity of what you actually are then amazingly uh, the psyche starts to spontaneously reconfigure itself um, in in alignment with that, having having received the the impact, as it were, of that realization. Mm. Mm. You talk a lot about digestion and digesting emotions. You've mentioned a number of times, and I really like that um, that terminology. Um, maybe you could speak a bit more about that, and also maybe perhaps relate that to the chapter "Listen to Your Heart" and this. Uh, yeah. This- kind of differentiation that we have or this you know obsession with uh is it emotional is yoga for example you know let's talk about yoga off subject ostensibly <laughs> you know is yoga a feeling thing and about embodiment or is yoga a patanjalian kind of a, their attempt at enlightenment which is you know taking ourselves out of the body into the realm of ideals a platonic kind of uh, cerebral endeavor you know um, and then this idea of digestion comes in, which you mentioned in the other uh, talk with me, which I really liked, which is a, a kind of tantric idea. And I know your background mm. is tantric in terms yeah. of uh, assimilation, you know, both thought and emotion at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, I could have done another chapter in the book on the near enemy of let it go, but I ended up working those teachings into other chapters. Uh, but you hear a lot in spiritual communities, just let it go. You're feeling anger, you're feeling fear, you're feeling whatever, just let it go. And from the tantric perspective, we say, well, that's actually dead wrong because all these emotions are part of your aliveness. They're part of your prana, part of your vitality. And so rather than trying to let them go, you want to actually digest them. Because when you digest emotions, especially if they're intense, then the emotion turns into pure aliveness. So you're experiencing this fear or anger or whatever. And if you can, um, to some extent, strip away the story associated with it and just experience the emotion as, as pure intensity, pure energy, then you find you're able to digest it. You're able to bring it all the way in and it spontaneously converts to life energy and you feel more alive. Mm. So there's more about how to do this in the book itself. Yes. Uh, yes yeah, yeah. But it's that's the key is that uh, instead of letting it go or pushing it away or renouncing it, we actually digest this uh, emotional energy and eventually we learn to digest our stories as well. And then we have more life energy available to us. And actually, it's slightly more complex because in the digestion process, some of the excess energy naturally flushes out. So we do end up letting go of, 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 some, of some of that energy, but not by you don't have to cue yourself to do that. If you just cue yourself to digest it, I can digest mm. this. I can be with mm. this and then allow it to digest into my core. Then naturally, some of it flushes out and some of it amplifies your aliveness. But again, this is only going to work if you can at least partially peel off the story that stuck to the emotional energy. Mm, mm. I think it's, I mean, it's a great teaching and, and, and not often heard these days, this idea of digestion, because people are walking through life and we never get a moment these days to take a moment and reflect, you know, I think that's a complete, you know, a, a particularly modern um, problem that we're having that, that, that we just aren't pause pause moments these days as much we know? don't have as much um, time for digestion yeah. yeah and so i'm yeah yeah this is a time when you might have a cigarette break <laughs> now you yeah. don't even, you're, not even, you're not even allowed to smoke anymore you used to have a cigarette and you might digest a little bit you know having yeah. that cigarette you might also digest right well, you know? that's the thing now you actually just look at your phone if you know? somebody yeah. were to uh, smoke yeah. but also digest their experience if they could actually do that i would bet anything they would be healthier, be healthier. physically healthier. than somebody who's not digesting their experience because that undigested experience toxifies in the system and that affects the physical body as well eventually best point best point ever because i used to love smoking so i may be <laughs> i'm not saying you should go back so, and, uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll tell the doctor he told me to. Um, yeah, but no, it's a great chapter. Uh, he's, you know, you mentioned the emotion becomes intensity, neither good nor bad. And the intensity becomes aliveness, as you just said. And the aliveness can express in all kinds of wonderful ways. And this is the idea of Tantra, basically, for people that aren't aware of the idea of Tantra. I believe Tantra comes from from the etymology or the a root of the etolo- etymological root of tan or thread or something continuous, some some continuity of experience that that, it's, that all all experience is allowed within the the spiritual path, as it were, and not some prioritized. This is a good one, and this isn't a good one. You know. Um, so, I mean, yes, I don't know part of the idea. Me. Everything. <laughs> it, it's not specifically related to the etymology of the word, actually, which etymologically tantra means. Um, an instrument for expansion okay. and, and it refers to yeah well because the root ton is to expand uh, and tra uh-huh. is an instrumental suffix it's what what you're referring to is the fact that the word tantra in other contexts can also mean a loom for weaving and so people kind of grabbed onto that idea oh it's like weaving together everything in your life to make a beautiful tapestry i love that teaching it, but it's I a modern it's a folkloric it's a modern it's idea a folk- oh no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still i fall great. into the old ha- hatha yoga sun moon kind of folkloric interpretation without my knowing yes no. but but here's the um, interesting part is like it can still be a valid teaching and a valid representation of the philosophy even though um the the factual claim being made this is the etymology is is wrong <laughs> okay yeah, right? yeah so it is valid in the sense that tantra does indeed seek to um not reject anything but rather to to weave all of our life experiences into the beautiful tapestry of of being and so every thread there's no thread that's rejected right it's rather let's find a way to weave it in where it becomes part of uh the beauty of of experience so indeed there's no such thing as negative emotions in this tradition and indeed i I make the argument in the book that um it there are no emotions that are intrinsically negative because they never prompt you to, to harm others, no matter how angry you are, the, the, the cause of harm is believing a story. It's so-and-so's fault. You know, they wronged me. Mm-hmm. I, they, they should be hurting like I'm hurting or whatever. So the anger itself is not what prompts harmful action. It's the believing a story. So the tradition is saying, as indeed um, other spiritual traditions also say, that ignorance is the problem, right? So in a non-dual mode, we understand the only actual problem is ignorance. It's not your emotions. It's, it's, not, it's nothing else. It's just a lack of understanding about uh, your experience that, that becomes problematic, right? Uh, and engenders suffering. So people don't realize, and most people don't realize, it's actually possible to have virtually all the so-called negative emotions and not suffer. You can experience sadness as beauty. You can experience anger as beauty. You can experience fear as aliveness uh, and, and, and so on. And so that, that's the thing is like, we're not, we don't need to try to um, have a, a different embodied experience. We need to have a deeper understanding that translates to a deeper mm. acceptance of our embodied experience and then uh it, it can totally open this door of 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 bliss really of joy and and beauty um where before we saw or imagined negativity mm. yeah it reminds me of um i used to st- I spent a lot, quite a lot of time with uh, Tibetan Buddhists when I was younger, and I remember one Geshe saying to me, "The problem is not your emotions; it's the confusion that you're not actually feeling any one emotion properly. You're just confused with an ambiguity of all these different emotions, and never properly understanding one emotion." Yeah. So uh, it had a lasting impact on me, but you know, because you always think where well, the problem is the emotion, but actually, it's not the emotion itself. The problem is the confusion that you're not actually ever properly embodying the emotion. In, you yeah, know, in its yeah, and, in its and, clear in its clear sense, and this is why tantra also comments on the role of art, because with um, by art I mean all forms of art, movies, novels, poems, everything, right? And what's interesting 
is when we go to the movies or when we read poems, we love sad ones as well as happy ones. We love the mm. whole range of artistic expression. We love feeling all the emotions that art can make us feel. And the reason we love it is because we're not taking it personally. So the tantric teaching is, if you cannot take your own life experiences personally, you can experience them as beautiful in the same way that you can experience a brilliantly done movie as beautiful, even though mm. it's also very sad in moments. I was going to ask you about enlightenment, but I think that kind of answers the question, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, you know, what more could one want? Like the, the, that, that kind of that kind of flowing experience, you know, because I mean, you know, there's some such a poignancy in, in so many, as you say, with, with art and with poetry. And you mentioned um, one of my favorite poems in your book, uh, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. Mm. I think you referenced Little Gidding. As, as you know, reading this, these kind of things, and, and of course, there's an incredible kind of sadness around it, but the emotion is actually beautiful if you're not somewhat in, ensconced or into, in kind of involved in your own story with it, you know, which exactly. then turns it into a hell. But uh, exactly. the, the pure emotion is just a. Uh, yeah, it's a poignancy. It's a yes, yeah, it's a joy in a way. Yeah. you know. So the problem is this false sense of self that 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 if you believe that there's this separate self that has this emotion, and you believe the emotion is negative or problematic, then you believe the self is problematic. You ha you you negatively evaluate the self, but this ver this self is actually imagined. Right. It's it's the assumption that the emotions belong to someone and reflect on that someone. But when we look to find that someone, we don't actually find it except as a thought. So I'm not saying there's there's no self. I, I'm saying mm -hmm. that what we believe to be the self is a psychological construct and it causes us tremendous suffering because we um, attribute the, the thoughts and emotions we think of as problematic to this imagined self, this constructed self, which is a social psychological construct. And so through the, the whole spiritual process, in a way, is dissolving that false self. And what we call true self is not a construct and and it's not separate also there's no such thing ultimately as separate self so the true self is the beingness that can't be um articulated in language but the pure beingness that we actually share with all beings and this beingness is intrinsically beautiful and it, everyone who t who experiences it uh, can testify to that. Mm, and experiencing mm. is not really so difficult. The difficult thing is uh, shifting the locus of identity from this psychologically constructed self to this pure beingness. That's the the, the project of so-called enlightenment. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe to on, along those lines to reference the teacher I know you like Ad Adyashanti. Um, mm. and, and he's saying, well, you know, like, it's not necessarily that different to what you might have felt already somewhat. Perhaps it's the, the understanding of the experience. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the enlightenment isn't somewhere up here that, you know, like you're going to have some, you know, some crazy kind of ping moments. You know, it's actually perhaps it's more down here in the present. It's just a question of understanding more clearly the experience that we're already having. And some of those moments, even when you talk about being this, I think everyone's had the moments of being this. It's just somewhat they haven't kind of consolidated to the degree that perhaps they could do, you know? So I suppose it's a certain way to, to say, like, how does one then use this teaching in daily life? And I'd like then to ask you, as I know I haven't got long with you, to ask you a little bit about your chapter, I Am My Own Guru. Um, <laughs> and how, you know, and yes, well, in the, in, you know, particularly this time and, and this week we've had, uh, with uh, with uh, certain figures um, and social media and gurus, um, to not mention any names. I mean, it seems opposite that the worry about uh, the worry about uh, being taught, you know, and receiving instruction on how to do what, it, which are you know difficult and somewhat risky things, is, is real. Um, and uh, you know, how how do we uh, how do we relate to a teacher these days in the modern idiom, which is not uh, not the same way as we may have originally uh, when these uh, texts were authored. Uh, in the geographical landmass we call India, uh, related to a teacher. 
Yeah. Well, this is a th- there's there's an argument here that it has more depth than we have time to get into. But essentially, in the book, I'm arguing that we absolutely need teachers on the spiritual path because, um, to use a metaphor, you can't draw a map to a place you've never been. <laughs> so the teacher is offering you a map, and and of course you 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 have a problem here, which is that um, the teacher has to have been or, or has to reside, in fact, where you want to go. And you can never be 100% sure because you're evaluating that from your, this uh, separate self perspective, this dualistic perspective. Um, and yet you, you have to rely on your own intuition and say, well, it seems like this person is speaking from the place I would like to reside in. So I'm going to listen to them. Um, And you really have no other option uh, unless you just want to trust to luck, (laughs) you know, which some people call luck grace. But still, (laughs) you know, if you want to actually do something to make this... um, paradigm shift <laughs> that that I think we shouldn't call enlightenment because that uh, pedestalizes it too much. But this paradigm mm. shift is really possible for any human being who's sufficiently interested in it. And we do need pointers from those who've already had the paradigm shift. And so uh, you, you, you have to just trust someone, listen to someone. And if after a while you feel like, mm, you know what, I'm not sure that this person is genuinely speaking from that place. Fine, then look for someone else and then listen to them. Because in that process, guided by your own intuition, nobody else's, mm. Mm. Uh, you keep deepening because as your sense of what you're, you're, you're feeling into gets deeper, your sense of who's worth listening to gets more accurate over time, right? So it's, it's a process that works. And then what can happen right, is this, this paradigm shift, which it's very, very hard to explain, because on the one hand, it's deeply familiar, like you're touching into something that you, you knew even as a little child and forgot. But on the other hand, it's not familiar. On the other hand, it's astonishingly different, because to, to see the world from the perspective of pure beingness instead of from the perspective of the conditioned mind is extremely different. It's an extremely different experience, um, even though it also has this element of, of familiarity. So uh, just when you're touching into it a little bit, you, you experience more of the familiarity. Uh, mm-hmm. or this is like, this is like, the innocence and wonder of a child. I, I, I remember this, you know, but as you go deeper into it, there's, there's this really profound paradigm shift where you're no longer looking to the mind um, to, to find the truth about anything because you've realized that the mind only produces mental representations of reality it never produces reality. So you have to learn to see without the mental filters. And when the filters fall away in it, it, substantially, as opposed to just a glimpse, then uh, that's when the paradigm shift is like, whoa, it's mind blowing. You know, it can be utterly mind blowing because you're not who you thought you were, but also nothing is what you thought it was Mm. because nothing is reducible to your concept of it. And so you end up in this blown open uh, space, this wide open space where uh, you're, you're no longer even an individual. Uh, There's, there's no words for the realization of, of what you are. And this is ultimately what yoga is all about, you know, in, in any of its versions, we can talk about this version and that version and how Patanjali is different from, from Tantra, but they at least agree on this. Mm, right? mm-hmm. that re- realizing your true nature as um, divine consciousness, just to put a label on it, no label works, but that's one we can put there. To realize that true nature is the goal of the path not only realize it, but it, be it, live from it. 
And that's where the different branches of the tradition can agree. So uh, Jesus said, uh, be like children. Really, that's a, a bit of a near enemy, really, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, be like, like children, but children not actually a child. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I had to say that. Um, but on a, <laughs> on a more serious note, I mean, you only say uh, that one of the last chapters in your book is all paths lead to the same goals. Now, you know, now for what you just said, I know it sounds like you're saying that, um, but you're not, because in this chapter, you very much say that you need a, you need to have an aim and need to suit your method towards that aim. And when you do that, yeah, I think you, you, you make some quite serious claims about how the, uh, the efficacy of your, of your progress your, you know, along that path will, will increase uh, you know, um, exponentially yeah. uh, once you've got clear your, what you're aiming for and suited your method appropriately. Now, I, I mean, you could definitely, that's one of my bugbears in the, in the yoga world is that you know, people really aren't clear what they're practicing for, you know, or they've got some ideas of Patanjali in their back pocket, you know, about some kind of chitta nit vritti narodaha, but yet they're practicing, you know, asana for, for quite a while a day, you know, like, uh, and also looking to feel and looking to experience in, in, in asana and in the world. Um, so, yeah, maybe you could just uh, uh, wrap up a conversation. We'll talk a little bit about, about that and, um, you know, how to, uh, yeah. maybe all paths don't lead to the same goal. Yeah, uh, certainly not, right? Because um, there's many religions and even and even what we call spiritual paths um, that have a goal, an explicit goal of an enjoyable after death state, you know, a heavenly after death state instead of a hellish one. That's the goal of that religion. And mm. there's branches of Buddhism that teach yeah. this just as much as uh, Christianity. So it's not just an East versus West thing. Um, so, you know, the yoga tradition is not, of course, a religion and it does have the branches of the tradition do embrace different versions of the goal, even though there's something in common, which is this th thing I mentioned of realizing our innate, uh, divinity. Um, but the, the thing you're touching on there about its alignment of, of view or philosophy with practice and with result, so we need to align those three things: our view, mm. our practice, and the result we're going for. And the thing is, <laughs> people when when they go to articulate the goal of practice, they often end up um, regurgitating something they've heard <laughs> about what the goal should be. And the first thing to do is to be as honest as humanly possible about what your goal actually is and no no waffling about oh um yes uh, we're not supposed to have a goal in yoga you know we're, we're just uh, practicing for the sake of it you know and the thing is yeah, if absolutely. you are actually practicing for the sake of it then you are already enlightened and i doubt that <laughs> that's the case right so if if, if if the practice itself is the is the purest joy imaginable then you don't need a spiritual path, okay? Mm, <laughs> but mm. if you and if you sense mm, there's more, there's a deeper experience possible than I'm having as of now. Mm. There's a more blissful, more expansive mm. experience possible. Um, it, then you're practicing for that, and but then you need to define it in in terms that make sense to you that are that are really real for you. And then once you've defined what you're practicing for, where you're aiming the practice, then you need to look at, uh, does the practice I'm, I'm doing uh, actually lead to that goal? Or is it likely to lead to that goal? And that's where we need to consult with teachers as well. And we say to our teachers, hey, well, this is my goal. Uh, and this is my practice. Do you think I'm missing something in the practice that might help me reach the mm. goal, right? And if, if the teacher has any real understanding of what you're talking about, and you say, oh, my goal is, is to have um, access to unconditioned joy um, and the full expansiveness of, of being, and my practice is an hour and a half of physical asana a day and 10 minutes of pranayama, then mm. the teacher, uh, again, if they know anything at all, will say, no, that, that practice is not going to lead to that goal. It's not going to actualize as that goal. Uh, you're going to need to add in some other elements such as, um, well, the problem is, what do we call it? Because as soon as I say meditation, people think, oh, that means 
stilling your mind, quieting the mind, mm. focusing mm. on one thing. But no, uh, I would use other terms actually, like communion with reality, <laughs> sitting in openness and being with what is, not your story about what is, but being with what is as fully as possible. That practice is indispensable if you want to actualize the more spiritual goals of yoga. Where, I mean, can I just ask where this current idea of meditation came in? And um, does it have a does it have a place yeah. where we, we yeah. pulled it from, or is it a really a modern fabrication? No, it, it comes simply from a misunderstanding of Patanjali, a misunderstanding right. of that sutra you cited, number 1.2, which people translate as, oh, yoga is stilling or stopping the fluctuations of the mind, right? But I argue <laughs> it's been mistranslated by most people, not all. And the real mm. translation, if you look in the commentaries and look deeper into the text, the, the correct translation is yoga is the state in which the churning, the churning of the mind has become still. And notice it's not then a verb telling you what to do, still your mind. That mm. yoga is the result of practice in that sutra. It's not the practice. It's the result of practice. Mm. And yeah, so that's the yeah. fundamental misunderstanding. If you practice... Uh, then you achieve the state of yoga, which is a state in which the churnings of the mind have settled, have become still of their own accord, spontaneously as a result of the practice. So the misunderstanding the, uh, that comes from that mistranslation, yoga is stilling the fluctuations of mind. I've got to still them. And mm. that's not what Patanjali was actually saying. And it's not what anyone would say if they really have deep experience in this because you don't get anywhere by trying to make your mind still you want to create the conditions in which the mind naturally settles down and eventually does uh drop into profound stillness of its own accord when they're talking in the say in the bhagavad gita then about meditation i mean there seems to be talking about you know sit you know there's a certain chapter i think chapter six sit with your spine straight and you're you know breathing in and out regularly on a seat of deer skin you know, <laughs> and kusha kusha grass you know the, what are they doing there you know i mean what i'm, what I'm trying to get at i suppose is this current idea of meditation as uh, you know particularly the passion or shini shamata meditation you know stilling them focusing the mind on one point you know, is that is that is that really ancient? Or is uh, that yes, it is. That's... It is. But but what what Tantra argues, um, and and I think this argument can be shown to be true. Is but the Tantra tradition says all of that is valid, but it is preparatory exercises. That the concentration on one point or one thing is a preparatory exercise, because what the deeper practice is learning to be with reality without the mental filters, to have radical clarity and communion with reality. Again, this is the tantric view. And for that, you first must learn to concentrate um, because if you go to just try to be with reality without any mental training, what'll happen is you're just gonna be with the churnings of the mind. You know, and so the mind uh, imposes itself in the center of experience way too strongly for most people until they've done some mind training. So that's the sort of Jedi aspect of the path. You need to do this mind training that and, and so but here's the thing. You're not trying to make the mind be still. You're just uh, cultivating concentration and focus in a relaxed way, not in a striving way, because striving reinforces the sense of doership and the separate self. Mm. So you've got to focus in a relaxed way. And then as you do that, then when you release the focus and open up to the total context, you find you're able to be with the total context much more fully subsequent to that concentration exercise. And so from the tantric point of view, if you're just doing these uh, meditations where you focus on the breath or whatever, mm -hmm. and not going on to the next stage, you're in a sense in making the meal and not eating it, right? So these, these are preparatory exercises that are, that are good, but um, 
the deeper teaching is missing. And it's not to say that the Bhagavad Gita, you know, was wrong because the tantric tradition argues that this deeper teaching uh, is supposed to be given orally, not in mm. a text, because the te mm. because you need coaching um, in real time from real a real human who's done it uh, in a way that a text can't convey so well. So they would say, the tantrikas would say, oh, Bhagavad Gita is perfectly good, but uh, the deeper stage is not given there. Mm. It does seem to suggest, though, that we're looking for, in the Bhagavad Gita, an emotionalist state. There's someone, you know, where they say, you know, kind of, to that person who's reached that state, a lump of gold or a piece of shit are equal. You know, everything is equal. There's no interest in anything almost. It's a dispassionless state. Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's hard to argue the Gita is, it could be anything to do with a tantric text, right? It it's, it's not a tantric text. No. Yet it received a tantric interpretation. Did where it? they said, okay, let's let's look at this right. uh, in another way. Yeah. So, for for example, uh, the Gita says um, one of the things it says is yoga is equanimity, samatvam, mm. and so people imagine that means being very unruffleable, very steady, almost emotionless, you know, mm. even keeled. Um, and the tantric tradition says, well, no, what this really means is that you have access to the equanimity of your true nature, even as your body mind is sometimes in turmoil, right? So the equanimity in question is not flattening out the mind. It's having access to the profound okayness of your real being, even when your mind is freaking out. Mm. And so Tantra says that's the real equanimity there. Uh, even if it might be the case that the Bhagavad Gita originally did have in mind a kind of emotional flattening out, right? So there's this there's this very brilliant reinterpretation, which I think is in service to uh, uh, a deeper truth. And, and with the lump of gold and piece of shit mm. or whatever, it's Didn't that in, in the tantric interpretation, yeah. it's not because you've renounced everything so completely that you you're equally dispassionate towards both. It's rather that you, you see that everything is a manifestation of the one consciousness and the gold and the piece of shit are equally a manifestation of the one consciousness, that the one becomes all this and that itself is fascinating and beautiful. And so we, we're not caught up in the mind's preferential picking and choosing as much, even though we still have preferences. The preferences aren't as important when you're experiencing that, that all phenomena are equally an expression of the one. And so that's the way they would interpret uh, that. So this is the inclusive nature of the mm. tantric tradition is it, it will reject uh, and negate some things like Patanjali's dualism, but in general, it tries to include as much as possible from the earlier tradition and just yeah. uh, reinterpret mm. it. Do you have a particular text in mind that, for that interpretation of the Gita? I know people are going to ask, oh, <laughs> ask him about which text is. So before I have to bother you with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been Say a, it now. Abhinavagupta wrote um, a commentary on the Gita, giving it a tantric interpretation. And that's called the uh, Gita, Sang, uh, Gita Sangraharta. No, I, I'm forgetting the title now. Um, Gita Sangraha, no, uh, Gitartha Sangraha. <laughs> that's right. But anyway, Excellent. okay. It, so that has been translated, but not as well as I would like. But we can put a link to to that if somebody's interested in in. Yeah, it, it's a absolutely. decent. I don't yeah. want to say it's bad. It's a right. decent translation. But um, uh, well, there's a bit more work for you to do anyway. Yes, <laughs> Try, really translate that tantric text. Um, okay. But 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 last thing on that. Sorry. Rather than yeah. looking for this or that book, the tantric yeah. tradition says you know find a good teacher. And they can share with you these beautiful reinterpretations uh, because oftentimes the books, it, unless they're translated brilliantly, they can be quite dry or incomprehensible. So we're, we're as a spiritual culture, we're a bit too um, book focused, I say, ironically, mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? But the, but discovering a book that you love really should channel you towards um, the teacher who, who wrote the book, because it's in these 
dialogues in this engagement that the spiritual path unfolds more efficiently. Because if we read, just read the books, we end up often being kind of armchair spiritualists and we feel good about the contemplations we're having, but they don't have the same impact on our daily lives. Yeah. And we can certainly uh, say that you've got enough stuff on YouTube as well. If you want to check Christopher out on YouTube, he's got loads and loads of uh, uh, very generous uh, chats on all things central on YouTube as well. So you can check him out after reading the book. And the book's got loads. Of, I mean, I wanted to ask you about loads of other chapters. I might just ask you about one more thing. But, uh, you know, other titles such as You Can Choose How You Respond. That's a really good chapter. Create Your Own Reality. We've talked about a little bit. Finding Your Soul's Purpose is very interesting. I mean, many people today suggest that everyone has their dharma, which, of course, we all do have our dharma, but that we have to actualize something into a kind of, you know, I've become a, you know, so-and-so movie star or yoga teacher or whatever, you know, you know, um, maybe you might talk about that. I was thinking, well, how can we close this? You know, there's a, a huge burden these days on becoming something, you know? Um, and I did interview someone uh, who, who wrote a book on, on finding your Dharma, you know, like everyone has their particular thing that they're their particular groove. And I know my wife has always worried about this. So, you know, I don't have a thing. You know, she says, you have a thing, you know, I don't have a thing. And I say, well, you don't need a thing. You know, you are what you are like, you know, um, so how would you, uh, how would you answer that question? You know? Yes. I, I think the notion of, um, and this is again, not just my opinion. I'm, I'm basing this on the traditional uh, teachings. Mm. The notion of finding your dharma is really profoundly misconstrued, and it's, mm. it's not a phrase that you ever would find in any of our primary sources. As if there's some kind of uh, mission or purpose um, written in the stars or or given by God that you're supposed to mm. discover. Um, this is, I think, not only wrong thinking, but but harmful thinking, <laughs> because then you end up with this suffering of, oh, I haven't found my purpose. What is my purpose? And the, the, your fundamental purpose, as I said, is simply to um, exist not only as you are now, but from the deepest fullness of your being, right? That's the only purpose that we have to, to, to be, but to mm. be more completely, to exist from mm. the deepest fullness of our being. Um, that can be the only purpose, and it's the same for each of us. And, and yet there is this thing, dharma, and dharma really it, it, here, it, it, we're talking about the concept of swadharma, right? My own dharma. And people, again, misconstrue that to be like my life mission or, or uh, mm. something like that. But it really just means um, responding appropriately to what arises on your life journey. And by appropriate, I don't mean some sort of judgmental attitude, but by, but by actually engaging with what arises on, on your life's mm. journey instead of um, pursuing some imagined ideal so this is indeed the problem is that people are constantly prioritizing their mental image of a possible reality over reality itself, which is perfectly insane, right? So following your dharma is nothing more than uh, engaging with what actually arises on the journey of your life and seeing where it leads you. And of course, there is some choice involved there because different things arise and you feel inspired to, to, to go more towards this thing that's arisen in your life than that thing. But you're still organically responding to what is arising rather than, you know, <laughs> doing this thing that the American culture has enshrined as, as, as a great thing, dreaming <laughs> right. Mm. Dreaming is a romantic term for imagining and giving more weight, priority and significance to your imagination, your mental image of a possible reality than to reality itself. And what the this tradition says is your, your deepest happiness is going to come actually from engaging in the aspects of reality that are most interesting and most inspiring to you and seeing where they lead. And you just keep doing that. It's following the golden thread uh, in, in your life. And so it, it, what the, the beauty that is in, in, inside of you, and there is beauty in each of us, whether we find it or not, <laughs> it can express more fully through this organic engagement with what's arising in life and not worrying about where is it leading me 
and not giving too much importance to these mental images, um, but but trusting that there's a, an organic unfolding to life, and mm. that simply giving energy to what is most inspiring to you that's actually happening in mm. uh, in your real life. Yeah. That is that is your dharma, and you know, and that's the thing. It, you have to relinquish this idea of of being a something that somebody can point to and say, you know, so yeah, seeing exactly. yourself through someone else's eyes, basically, exactly. rather than you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. So your now wife you can experience. experience profound yeah. fulfillment um, yeah. without ever embodying a, a role that someone could point to and say, oh, that's what she is, because that's just a <laughs> mental construct. You know, so you don't need a thing, but you do need to keep pursuing that which is most inspiring to you um, of all the things arising within your sphere. Yeah. Well, I always tell her you don't want to be a yoga teacher anyway. It's something else. <laughs> it's overrated. <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's been a, such a wonderful chat with you, Christopher. I, it's been a long time since I found someone so interesting as uh, Christopher Harish. Um, so, uh, you know, I thank you. And I hope that our guests will enjoy uh, your presence and, and all the stuff that you share as much as I have and do. Um, yeah, and the book is wonderful. Um, so please uh, go out and, and check out Near Enemies of the Truth. Uh, totally recommend it. And uh, yeah, all links in the in the notes below um thank you for your time because it's so much appreciated um thanks for coming on again thank you it's it's wonderful to talk and um yeah maybe we could do this uh uh you know a couple times a year going forward or or whatever you you, you think but it's uh, just an, so enjoyable to chat with you it will be an honor thank you <laughs> hope you enjoyed the episode remember you can always find out more about the tradition of non-dual Shaiva Tantra at tantrailluminated.org where, if you wish, you can become a subscriber to our online learning portal and you'll receive access to a vast number of recordings including a comprehensive curriculum in Tantric philosophy, Tantric yoga, guided meditation, and much, much more. Music for the podcast, composed and recorded by Anne Leader. Find her at anneleader.com. Podcast produced by Grazia Tribulato. New episodes drop every week. And may all beings benefit. <laughs>